for the Constitution. The Constitution is blocked. Uh, we, uh, we have heard about re, uh, writing again the small law given to us about uh, open uh, data. And uh, in the same time, you see, we have official uh, sites. You can ask for the data, but you have to fulfill an application form with your name, your address, why and how. That's not possible. That's even dangerous. So what can we do? We began with universities, uh, by park camps, and I think uh, we'll have to ask the civil society in Tunisia, but also outside Tunisia, to help us, to help us to, uh, operate, uh, to operate more campaigns, to uh, widespread the cultural da the data, and also the idea of open data and simply the freedom. Now we are in a uh, country that is democratically blocked, without a constitution, so without uh, uh, real rights, even for, uh, for open data. But the, we, we can see that civil society, and I'm telling that for the second time, can make the difference. So that's why I am here in uh, this conference. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Hong Kong, and next up, Hungary. I have to say, I prepared this slide for Baltra because she didn't send me hers, but then she came up with this one, which has more fun. <laughs> the other, okay, the other one is nicer, definitely, but I thought I'd put a little bit more information about Hong Kong. Okay, what is the story that the world can learn from Hong Kong and open data? And I thought one of the interesting things is that opening data just a little bit, and I think that is a situation in all countries that are not <coughs> democracies and that they don't have open data laws and so on, but still want to swim on that internet economy uh, way and become modern and forward-looking and citizen-engaged. So, and I think for that type of countries, the majority of countries are not democracies on this planet. Hong Kong could be a good model. So, um, opening data just a little bit. So, we started the Open Data um, Initiative in 2011. Um, and it is actually on the whole website, open data does not appear as a word. We call it public sector information. And um, it is uh, designed as an interface for the public to obta obtain certain type of information. So, and now in the, I'm part of the Open Data Hong Kong, which is a civil society group. Uh, we try to figure out what is actually certain type of information and what is the information that we cannot get and is not there. So uh, on the, on the uh, portal you can see the typical um, data sets that all countries have, like statistics, traffic, environment, um, and, and so on. Um, but uh, we want to, uh, it, so it's still a journey on what type of information will be available there. But I also want to show you uh, this as an example um, of a country which is very highly advanced. And I gave you the figures here. Hong Kong is always number one, two, three in the World Competitive uh, Index. It's very high up in uh, e-governance e -governance readiness. It's in the World, Economy, uh, World Bank Knowledge Economy Index rank uh, 18. Um, and in the global innovation rank seven. So it has all the ingredients of a very forward-looking open economy, but at the same time, we don't have um, open access information and free information laws in the country. We also don't have um, these laws uh, about open licensing of government information. So, and I think if we put these ingredients together, you can see that um, we are still quite far away from anything like a data-driven policy making. So, and I think many governments at the moment are throwing data sets at the public mm -hmm. and then think, oh, there will be a developer community doing something with this data. But they are not really thinking about changing their way of decision making or policy making or also anything like uh, collaborative policy making in this, uh, in this kind of uh, new thinking. And so I think the mindset is, for me, something that is still missing there. And, um, uh, and I also want to briefly introduce uh, the key operating principle, and that was stated in the government uh, talk. And it's 
bring convenience to the public. And I think Hong Kong is all about convenience. But is that enough for open data? Thank you. Okay, thank you
So what we are trying to do is like convince these data suppliers to have those data published into Open Data Portal, and thereby where uh, the way our approach is to approach uh, them, convince them, and you know build their capacity to uh, build their capacities to you know publish it by themselves, so that we can hook up uh, those data in uh, our portal, right? So. On doing that, uh, and you know, like uh, we've been working on this for almost a year now, and you know, like suddenly we have been able to uh, pursue persuade at least few government entities to publish their data in open standards, which is now going to be part of our portal. And then after doing that, what after data? Right. So we want to build capacities, capacities and skills in two sides. One, working with technology groups. We work a lot with uh, students, have uh, been uh, conducting hackathons and bar camps to play around that data and create meaningful apps. But at the same time, more importantly, what we are trying to do is, what we've been doing is uh, building capacities and skills of data users, you know, primarily intermediaries uh, who are necessarily NGOs working at the grassroots and to, so that we could really push this uh, data-driven advocacy and lobbying rather than going for simply advocacy and lobbying. And then after that, we want to do an impact research on how the access to open data has actually created a difference. That is the top layer that you would see. So this is the kind of experimentation that we're trying to do in Nepal, and if we become successful, then we would want to hand it over to a larger community, and then, you know, like, we do, because we do not necessarily want to be the custodian of data in Nepal, rather we want to build capacities within the government and other stakeholders. So that is a Nepal right? Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Okay, next up, Moldavia. Thank you, Mr. I'm pretty much so. My name is Victoria Vlad. I represent, uh, I'm from the Republic of Moldova. Uh, I don't represent uh, the independent think tank I work at, at this session. I will at the other session. Um, but I will talk a bit from the government's perspective more. So the civil society uh, on the government, on the work of the government. So um, the image kind of describes the bumpy road that Moldova embarked on in 2011 when it started the e-transformation agenda. Um, the Open Government Data Initiative in Moldova launched in April 2011 as a part of uh, the, e -gover the governance e-transformation agenda. Um, and the interesting thing is that it is not a standalone initiative, but it is, uh, it is only one of the 13 pillars of e-transformation in Moldova. So um, I'll mention about challenges, um, and about uh, latest news, and some of the next steps. So in regards to latest news, Moldova has recently, uh, in actually in March this year, signed, the parliament has approved the, um, the law on public sector information reuse to comply with the EU uh, PSI directive, which is public sector information directive. And currently we're waiting for the government decision to implement that law, which would uh, present the open data license and conditions for data reuse. And it will um, also outline the formats in which the government institutions should publish the data. Also, the government is currently developing a new uh, data portal on a CPAN platform. It should be launched at the end of this year. Another update relates to integrating the uh, GIS into this portal. So basically, uh, geospatial, ref uh, geospatial referencing. Uh, and then one another is interoperability platform. It's planned for the next year. Uh, that is supposed to bring, to bring clarity into who wants what data. Uh, in regards to challenges, one major challenge is that some institutions still cannot release their data for free, and that is because they have this releasing data as a part of the, their business model. Um, in regards to next steps, Moldova currently is working on its Open Government Action Plan for 2014-2015, so it's a common effort both by the government and the civil society. It's um, a major focus will be on opening up more financial data and hopefully, uh, in relation to this image, more uh, hopefully more um, detailed and segregated data at the level of uh, spendings for, for roads and all the funds that we're receiving in um, our country. And hopefully uh, citizens will get more engaged in that so they um, they really look out for the information they need. So they'll find the real value of open data. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now Brazil, and after that, France. Hi, I'm Everton, I'm just Tom from Open Knowledge Foundation Brazil. We are saying, saying the importance here of the access of information law in Brazil, the top, which is running for one year and a half, which was approved in the end of 2011. It is very aligned with the open data. Uh, 
government that so that you have to have machine readable information, access to information. Like actually, a lot of data we are asking for the government. Sometimes they are not getting for us. So we oh, it's not appearing. What? Oh, so many images. Oh my God. But okay. It's probably my fault. Sorry. <laughs> so in the first, there was open the active groups in Brazil. We have uh, Open Knowledge Foundation Brazil was the first uh, icon. The second, WWC Brazil, which is coordinating a working group on open data since 2010. Uh, GEPOPI, uh, Access to Information Research Group at the University of Sao Paulo. And the Bottle Transparency Hackers, it's a huge community around Brazil, more than 1,000 people using a mail list to discuss open data, access to information. You are one of the groups who were pressuring to have the access of information approved. There are a lot of... Uh, there are a lot of... Uh, a good obstacle from uh, some people from the army because they are going to release also data from the dictatorship period. So what we are doing now, we have the INDA, National Infrastructure of Open Data. So civil society is participating together with the government. Some people from some ministries are not participating. For instance, the Science and Technology Ministry, they should be there, they are not. Like the Open Government Partnership also has a lot of, it seems to be a bit more fashion in some sense that uh, when they have to release the plan that were built together with the civil society, we didn't have enough time. And you know, civil society has less resources as compared to the government or the industry to organize ourselves, to uh, analyze and give some feedback. And now we have also the OD4D, Open Data for Development. You are said during the Abre Latam in Uruguay, also trying to have this portal to map all the open data initiatives in, in Latin America. And so what's happening, let's just conclude, we have the federal level, we have a good portal on open data. Uh, we have to work together in the local level, it's happening in the city council of Sao Paulo. We have made a hackathon together with them. And in Recife, they have just released an open data portal. And have, Brazil has 26 states, and have only like, you can see four states with some open data portals which has been released together with the access to information law. And one of the challenges here is also you have to work with this data and to build sustainable projects. And it's like we make these hackathons and sometimes we have the apps and how to... Oops, cash. <laughs> how to... <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Russia. Hello, my name is Claire. I'm from uh, Open Knowledge Foundation France. In France, we do have a freedom of information access law. We do have a national platform with data.gov.fr. So we are, and we also have organizations, civil organizations like Regard Citoyen and OKF in France, uh, releasing data like um, budget, secret budget lines of the parliament and, and so on. So there is a good um, initiative, we are on the way, but we still have limits, which are the quality of the data that are released, which is, most of them are not really good uh, in uh, quality, which uh, another limit is the, um, the extension of the data release. We didn't have really a new data release or something really we didn't even know that existed. So we are waiting for more data, bigger data, better quality data. And um, also another issue is that um, we really separate open data from open government or participation and collaboration. There is really a split in the two um, initiatives and that's an issue because open data is only um, publishing data and that means you don't change the way government works. And that's an issue because all the point is changing the way um, the government is, um, is working. But we still have some good news on the way. Um, there is a discussion of a law obligating uh, cities uh, to open data if they have more than 3,500 3, inhabitants and so on. And um, so it's on the way. Thank you very much. Next, Russia, and after that will be Argentina. Good afternoon. My name is Evgeny Stunin. I'm from Russia. I represent uh, National Research University High School of Economics, and um, uh, we help a lot federal government of Russia to implement the big scale project in open data. And I'm telling you a little bit what's now the situation. Um, uh, first of all, um, um, 
government, uh, Russian government developed uh, Russian national open data uh, conception and roadmap, so declared its way to implement open data and showing it that it's an important uh, issue. And uh, uh, um, some changes were made in legal framework defining what's open data and uh, bringing some requirements and obligations for, for government agencies how to work with open data, how to use it. Also, methodological recommendations were developed on data publishing, and uh, agencies started to publish data, and now federal agencies uh, brought out more than uh, 1,000 uh, data sets uh, uh, online, they're available. Uh, right now, the, uh, the government discusses, uh, and soon we will release, I, I believe that to the end of 2013, we're going to get a uh, launch of uh, national uh, open data portal which would integrate the, 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 the data sets from, from different agencies. Um, also, we have, uh, not all of them, we have uh, 83 regional authorities. Uh, we have at least 7 or 10 from them, uh, which release open data in a very active way, sometimes even act more active than the federal government does. I'm talking about the Moscow government, and also we have such uh, authority as Ulyanovsk Oblast. So um, uh, we are on the way, uh, and uh, I would completely agree with uh, representative from Hong Kong, uh, it's uh, still uh, a lot of things to do. Uh, uh, the good thing happening is that we have a very good institutional base. Uh, open government, uh, open data was given a priority. We have uh, open government council, institutionalized in government, so it leads. We have a special open government minister, so we lead uh, this process. But of course, uh, issues of uh, future usage, bringing developer, developers and uh, improving uh, legal frameworks uh, are still uh, our challenges, which we would continue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, Argentina and of that, the other man. Uh, hi, I'm going to talk uh, not about Argentina in general, at the national level, but uh, about the city of Buenos Aires, mainly because the Open Data Initiative in Argentina at the national level has been launched like a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, as part of the, uh, one of the OCP commitments. In the case of the city of, of Buenos Aires, that is the capital city of Argentina, uh, starting a year and a half ago, uh, around March 2012, and was, the introduction of, of the topic was mainly product of uh, three elements, stable ideas, I mean, we all know about all the open data initiatives around the world, but there were also some policy entrepreneur, entrepreneurs in the public sector and some civil society actors working on, on this topic. Um, I'm going to try to be with you. Uh, these policy entrepreneurs are innovators coming mainly from the e-government and new media units, we're in touch with uh, many initiatives around the world and we're trying to introduce this topic in the city of Buenos Aires. The local uh, elections at the end of 2011 uh, provided a window of opportunity to introduce this element uh, in the city. In March 2012, uh, a decree on open government, that's the name of the decree, was introduced in, in the city. Just briefly, uh, one of the main characteristics of this policy is the centralized this centralized responsibility over the disclosure, so each agency is in charge of disclosing or not uh, the data sets that they have. Uh, another thing related to that, there are no institutional mechanisms to solve disputes, as in the case of freedom of information legislation, so maybe right now that's not a problem, but it could be in the future. Uh, the agency is working in two main lines, one of them is the open data portal itself, and the other is the community building. They are providing a, a lot of effort and resources uh, <coughs> to, the, to, this, to building a community because they know that without the demand of, uh, of the civil society, they don't have the, the capacity to ask for new data sets within the public sector. Uh, so far, they have 68 data sets. They've been organizing plenty of events, and they have a government <coughs> lab that's a physical space within the these units uh, to, uh, for people from government and civil society to exchange ideas and to try to win new tools. In terms of uh, civil society, I just want to, to add that um, transparency-oriented NGOs are still not so engaged with this new way of uh, accessing uh, and reusing open government data, mainly because of lack of resources, but what I, I see so far is the difficulties in terms of uh, not a common language, they are 
don't seem to get along pretty well and they have to work a lot to to be new. new. Okay. <laughs> I got it talking later. Okay, thank you. Although my favourite story from um, Argentina was at uh, the uh, Open Data Latin America conference when La Nación had oh. taken 33,000 PDFs of Argentinian Senate expenses and uh, crowdsourced them into reusable data. And, they needed to do that. I mean, and was no yeah, idea. and uh, so information people thought was well hidden suddenly starts to get very embarrassing. Okay, <laughs> next up, next up, Lila Ban, and following that, Uganda. Uh, my name's Graham Jones. Um, my day job's in the, uh, the Armand Parliament, um, but I've been campaigning for Open Data now for about 10 years, uh, even to the point where I've been to court and that kind of thing. Um, all the continuous parliament in the world, uh, but no FOI law. Um, however, we've just got our draft bill um, scheduled for December, so that's uh, quite a lot well, of result of a lot of uh, lobbying. Um, we've got a draft uh, open data strategy. Uh, it's been very bottom up, uh, trying to prove uh, from you know, sort of real use cases. So we've been pushing things like uh, opening up the corporate register, uh, you know, sort of uh, public transport with uh, Google Transit um, legislation. My, so sort of my day job really has been secondary legislation. Uh, we never had an index of all the secondary legislation. Um, so now we've uh, collated together about four five thousand pieces of legislation going back to fourteen seventeen. Um, about to go live next month. Um, and uh, I80 as well, so I've um, hacked together all the PDF into, into data and working with other people. Um, so really it's just been a, a sort of like a two-year journey, I guess, and uh, we've had a lot of help from uh, people in other countries, you know, people like Chris Tepper from Open Corporate, or Stephen Fowler, or uh, Julian Tate, you know, various people that have helped, and, and that's been uh, the way forward really for a place where I think uh, Hong Kong, you know, for example, uh, you've got to do a little bit first, but you've got to get help if there's any fear. That's it, really. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, Uganda, and after that, Kenya. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rainer Bettenberg. I work for a small NGO called Fruits of Thought and have a company called Mountbatten. Um, I live in Uganda for about nine years now. Um, we had a sort of a kickoff meeting last year. There was a lot of government, uh, it was led by uh, development. There was a lot of government interest, uh, there were some NGOs, uh, we launched a website, OpenDev.UG, we launched a CCAM portal called Data.UG and uploaded all the data sets that we could find, either uh, generated by external parties outside of the country, or mainly by the Uganda Bureau of Statistics, that's quite a uh, well-functioning uh, Bureau of Statistics in the African level, <coughs> and they have, they have published a lot of data over the years. Uh, we're also running a geo node that has to use spatial information. In the coming months, we hope to update the infrastructure of that. One of the one things we plan to do is upgrade CCAN to DCAN. It's a triple based CCAN uh, 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 compatible, uh, compatible product. And uh, uh, then we hope to go out more. We do go out, but we hope to go out more and engage with people who can actually use the data hackers, journalists. There's a, a Code for Kenya split-off uh, running in Kampala called Hackers Hack. They get together and they, uh, they hack with data. We always try to show new tricks of what you can do with data. Um, a lot of people tend to underestimate what is possible with uh, both data sets and, uh, uh, and technology. Um, and then there's one interesting example that we were lucky to do uh, uh, over the last uh, year. We was a um, Spanish PhD student that we asked to play around with open data a little bit. She went out into the internet, found open data in three, four different sources, and she was actually able to tell a story to draw a conclusion about uh, the type of water point you could uh, better not use because it would lower the income of the, uh, the average income of the family. And that was with available data, open data in Uganda. Uh, so uh, we, she wrote a white paper about it. We go around with that white paper, go like, you guys, this is possible already. And we haven't, we don't, there's no, um, uh, we're not releasing data on a structural level yet, uh, even. So yeah, the potential is really high. Uh, the climate is there. And uh, uh, next year, we have more people and we have more to destroy. Kenya and then California. Who's in Kenya? I think she left. 
Scholar. I'm working for the Open Knowledge Foundation in Germany. I'm spontaneously uh, jumping in to tell some things about Germany. Unfortunately, um, there is not too much good news from Germany. Things are moving slowly. Um, Germany has still not joined the OGP. Um, there's elections next weekend, but yeah, there's not much hope that it's going to change uh, quickly. Um, uh, some federal states do not even have freedom of information laws yet. Um, there's a lot of cities with open data portals. Um, a net nationwide or a national portal has been launched this year. Um, govdata.de, so they kind of uh, eliminated the open because before it was called OpenGov uh, Data DE. Um, so it's only a data portal for, um, yeah, for non, or, or also for non-open data. They have a lot of PDFs up there, not a lot of really interesting um, data sets. They have a lot of structural data. They uh, created their own uh, license for Germany, which is also a problem when it comes to, or a challenge when it comes to combining data sets um, or the reuse of data sets, as you all know. Uh, we tried to, or we were lobbying against that, um, but they yeah, still um, yeah, developed their own license. And um, they have a lot of non-commercial licenses on their data portal, which makes it also difficult to reuse the data sets. Um, and a lot of civic data is missing, so there's not a lot of really exciting data for developers. That's why people are not reusing the data sets a lot. You don't see a lot of apps or a lot of visualizations because it's um, mostly pretty boring and abstract data sets. Um, so after the backlash with the license, we started to focus on working with developers to create some prime examples. To because um, before we were always showing the good examples from the UK and, and from the US, and we tried to, uh, or we did an incubator program last year to also have some examples from Germany to um, yeah give change agents within uh, public administration some um, good uh, examples, best practices, and arguments. Yeah, so that was it from Germany. unbelievable, but we still have time left. So if you're from a country that you haven't shared updates with us from, we encourage you to jump on stage. Okay. What countries, can I see hands before, and country names? Uh, Italy. Italy. India. Oh, sorry, go ahead. India. India. And I would uh, re represent South Sudan. South Sudan. That's, and, <laughs> and the Philippines. That's awesome. So four, can we take five? What's Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia? Can we take five? Yep. Five quick ones. So, Italy first, please.
some successes. Uh, for example, uh, in the last month, uh, we launched this Up For Me contest, uh, which is a success actually, because uh, we got some 64 submissions, so it's, it's a good news, it's a good news. Um, and other two portals um, I want to... Uh, we have this uh, Open Coesione, which is a best practice, also defined as a best, as a best practice by Nidicruz, uh, because it's a um, national portal um, about the uh, European structural funds uh, and projects realized in Italy. Uh, very important for us, especially for the South. Of, the, of our country, and uh, um, we have to say that uh, in Codice di Amministrazione Digitale, which is the, uh, the, the law, uh, the, the passive law in Italy, uh, we contribute, we, we contribute, <laughs> okay, okay, that, that's all, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, next up, but next up India. And then South Sudan. Hi. Sorry, because this is ad hoc. I don't have any slides or anything. Um, but very quickly, two points. Um, one about the open data portal. Um, and so India really started the open data portal last year. And uh, after now, about 15,000 data sets have been released, and the government's collaborating very, um, uh, very actively with the open data community. Uh, however, there isn't a coordinated open data movement in India, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is something we're looking at really. Uh, so there are there are uh, open data hubs everywhere in in few cities, where the developer community is very active. Um, uh, but that's. Uh, I think there needs to be a more centralized, more, more uh, sort of a uh, coordinated open data movement in India, which I think they're building again, building towards. But what I really wanted to share with you all is, is the recent, uh, uh, is the Right to Information Act, which is perhaps considered one of the best in the world in India. Uh, um, it's, um, and, and uh, having earlier heard about Hungary and everything, uh, we recently, the government started to bring about amendments to the, Right to Information Act, by which, through which they were trying to exclude the political parties out of the ambit of the Right to Information Act. As it is, we have very little transparency as far as political parties are concerned. There, there is financial transparency and other forms of transparency. So, a, a group of our citizens from different parts of the world, we sort of uh, built a social media campaign around it, and um, within three weeks, we were able to force the government to sort of defer the amendments to the standing committee, which was itself in itself quite a big achievement. Sort of taking on the government along with the a unified opposition. Um, so, uh, we have been we've managed to defer it to the standing committee. But now there has to be a, a big informed debate with the, with the standing committee on what sort of transparency are we looking at? Uh, what do we mean by transparency of political parties? Uh, are we are just so so anybody who um, I, I would uh, I'm also here to sort of collect international best practices on on transparency of political parties so that when we go back to the standing committee in a few weeks' time, we uh, we are able to a educate the public so that they can then call their elected reps and say why they want uh, uh, transparency in the political party functioning and what sort of transparency are they looking for. So um, anybody who has a best practice to share from their countries, uh, can you please pick me? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next up, South Sudan and then the Philippines. And can we also later on get an update from Switzerland? Yes. Yeah. Come on. Hello everybody, my name is Stephen Kovats, I'm here from Berlin, uh, from the Agency for Open Culture and Critical Transformation. I work together with a group of people internationally and in South Sudan. South Sudan is the newest state uh, in the world, it's been around for about two years. Um, and one of the things that I'm working with there is with various political leaders who
So my name is Stephen Kovacs and I'm from the Berlin Agency for Open Culture and Critical Transformation. I work together with a number of people and organizations as well as governments in the new state of South Sudan. South Sudan uh, has been an independent country since 2011, so just over two years ago, and basically has to build all its civil society structures and government apparatuses from scratch. So it's a perfect opportunity to bring in the ideas that are behind the Open Knowledge Foundation, Open Government Initiatives, and Open Data to help create this new country. So one of the projects that we're working on is this. We've got some propaganda material here, OS Juba, which is about open sourcing Juba, the capital of South Sudan, as well as looking how open source methodologies and the whole realm of open knowledge and open system solutions can create the way forward in this brand new country, which is also a product of, in a certain sense, the international community. So let's work together and let's create this new place. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gabriel Balez from the government of the Philippines, specifically from the Department of Budget and Management. I'm also the co-lead coordinator for the Open Data Initiative of the Philippines. Um, essentially, we want to use our Open Data portal as an inducer of our impending uh, Freedom of Information Bill. Um, we are bound to launch our Open Data portal, data.gov.ph, by November 26. We hope to invite the international community to visit our website, our portal, by December. So essentially, we, we, we in, in, in our Open Data, we kind of realized that Open Data wasn't really a new initiative. Yes, we, had, we wanted to launch a portal, but when we launched the program, we discovered that Open Data wasn't a new program. For example, our Department of Transportation already had a hackathon using their transportation data. Um, when we engaged our Department of Indian and Local Government, we realized that they have a full disclosure policy portal where they have around 81,000 uh, financial documents of, uh, of our local government units. So hopefully, we use the Open Data Initiative to be the ultimate or umbrella platform for our open data program and uh, again we, we hope to invite the trans community to visit our portal on December and uh, as, as run-up events we'll be engaging CSOs to for example know what are the juiciest data they want to see we'll be conducting hackathons and hopefully we get to have a full program by the by 20